Have you had an argument or a disagreement with your child lately? Is your child young or an adult? Mm, now how did that end? Did you manage to resolve it or is it still sitting out there like an ugly splat on the wall that neither of you can get past? Have you tried to make up and if so, how? Recently I've been talking to a lot of friends and witnessing many people from my generation facing conflicts with their adult children. And what I've noticed is that many of us don't have the cues or the knowledge to argue respectfully or repair those rifts effectively. So today I want to talk about navigating conflict and repair, both with young and adult children. Because you know what? We all get annoyed. We all have arguments. But we don't want the result of those arguments to linger, potentially scarring our relationships. Because yes, conflicts may leave scars, but we don't want to leave open wounds. Our goal is to understand our kids, whether they're children or adults, because we love them. As you listen, think about how you resolve, or don't resolve, conflicts with your children. My hope is that today you're going to take away some cues based on personality temperament to help you handle these situations a little differently. And if you don't see any issues with yourself because you feel like you're always right, well, why not try sitting down with your child and asking how they see things between you? You might find it might be a little different. Hi, I'm Kate Mason, and welcome to Parenting and Personalities. This is the podcast that connects you to the ones you care about the most. Now, here's a familiar scene that many parents might recognise. When my children were younger, I was in the kitchen cooking dinner one night, stressed, overwhelmed by the week ahead and, because I'm who I am, overwhelmed by the week that went past and feeling like I hadn't kept up with everything I should have done. And now let's be honest, cooking dinner is not my thing. I do it because I love the connections we make around the table, but the actual act of cooking, mm -mm, not my favourite thing at all. Anyway, my son Jack, who was around 12 years old at the time, walked in to see what was for dinner and went, oh, not roast again. I glanced at him and he said, oh, it looks disgusting. Now at this point, I'm tired, frustrated, and I just snapped. I yelled, well, what's wrong with you? Can't you just be grateful that I'm here cooking dinner for you? Hmm, have you ever done that? Now, this is when things just go downhill. He yelled back, I hate you and I hate your food. And he stormed to his room, leaving me standing there feeling pretty awful. And then the guilt comes rushing in and I found myself thinking, why did I react like that? What is wrong with me? Am I messing my kid up because I yelled? Now, if you're a parent, you've probably felt that sinking feeling too. You know, the one where the guilt and shame starts creeping in. However, the reality is, there is no such thing as a perfect parent. Parenting is full of all these moments, these collisions and conflicts. And you know what? When we make mistakes, which we all do, what matters is how we respond afterward. Do we just move on and pretend it didn't happen? Or do we need to go back and say something that really addresses it? So let's think about what it might mean to write a better story after a moment of rupture, like an argument and begin to repair with ourselves first. It's not easy, but this is what I remind myself. I might not have handled things well, but you know what? That doesn't define me. I know I'm a good parent, even if I mess up every now and then. And recognising this stops me from spiralling into that self-guilt or blame, and instead it really grounds me. Have you ever felt that spiral yourself and been unable to pull yourself out of it? There's no perfect formula for this, but the repair process is what brings back connection, trust and safety that might have been lost in that moment of anger and frustration and stress. And for parents, this is huge, because when we don't repair, our children are left to figure it out on their own. Now, if a child doesn't have the tools, they might turn to self-blame themselves and wonder, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do anything right? And we know where that can lead. Low self-worth, feelings of hopelessness, even anxiety. 
So for us as parents, it's really about taking responsibility. It could sound something like this. Hey, I've been thinking about what happened in the kitchen. I'm sorry, it probably felt really scary for you, and it wasn't your fault. A 15-second intervention is all you need to show your child that their sense of self is secure, that they're safe, and that you're connected with them. That's huge. Replacing the story of self-blame with one of self-trust, safety, and connection has a lasting impact. Now here's what we want to avoid when we try to repair. Think of how it would sound if I said, Sorry I yelled at you, but if you hadn't complained about dinner, honestly, it wouldn't have happened. Or, you should be grateful for a home-cooked meal, and then I wouldn't have yelled at you. Statements like this don't repair the bond, although I'm sure many of us have actually said them. Instead, they subtly blame the child, implying that it was their fault that we got angry. That's not the kind of self-regulation or emotional intelligence we really want to model. It's better to avoid phrases like, if only you, or but you, which shift responsibility back onto the child. Instead, let's look at what healthy reconnection can do, both now and in the future. When we connect positively, our kids don't have to spiral into self-blame when they make a mistake. They learn that it's okay to take responsibility for their behaviour without carrying the burden of someone else's emotions. Once we reconnect, I can even guide my son into changing his behaviour by saying something like, You might not always like what's for dinner, But instead of saying it's disgusting, maybe you could say, hey mum, that's not my favourite. Now this teaches him to express his disappointment respectfully and strengthens his skills in emotional regulation and communication. And here's an important takeaway. If you're thinking right now, oh no, this won't work, my child's older than yours, or oh my goodness, I've done a lot worse than that. Remember, it's never too late. We can always work on repair no matter how old our kids are. As you know, our experiences and life situations shape much of who we are today, but so do our genetic personalities. In my work, I often talk about how personality and temperament shape how we react and behave. And when it comes to repairing relationships, understanding both your temperament and your child's can make a really big difference. Because it's not just about saying sorry. A good repair involves more than just a quick apology. So today I want to focus on how our temperaments play a powerful role in how we express anger, sadness and forgiveness and what we might need to do to make things right when we inevitably are going to make those mistakes. Now, whether you relate to one particular temperament or a combination, we'll look at how you can repair and reconnect after moments like the one I've just described. Now let's take a look at how understanding your temperament can help you approach the situations that fit who you are so we can make it a better story each time. When we look at the four temperaments, if you're familiar with DISC profiling, I'm going to use the temperament definitions and their equivalent in DISC. So number one is the sanguine, the influencer. Two, choleric, the dominant. Three, phlegmatic, steadiness. And four, melancholic, the conscientious. Now let's explore what it might be like to be a sanguine, the influencer especially when it comes to relationships, our emotions, and the process of repair. Now, I know very well how a sanguine feels, because I am one, almost 100%. Now, most people know that sanguines are the life of the party. We're social, optimistic, enthusiastic. We thrive on good connections and good vibes. Most of us are warm and outgoing, and we draw our energy from experiences, and we love being around people. Spontaneity is second nature, and our adaptability makes everything seem fresh and exciting. If you're a sanguine, you're probably a great communicator. So when it comes to right or wrong, that's really not a big deal for us. We'd like to be correct, but for sanguines, it's more important that, honestly, everyone's having a good time and getting along, because harmony and fun are really high on our priority list. Instead of needing to win an argument, a balanced sanguine can go further by actually learning to slow down and consider other perspectives, especially in conflict. A bit of patience and listening can go a long way, especially since listening actually isn't our strongest point, because we do like the sound of our own voices. One of our biggest strengths is how we connect with others. Our energy and charisma inspire others, making us a joy to be around, even if I must say so myself. 
But like anyone else, we have our blind spots. Sometimes in our pursuit for fun and positivity, we can overlook responsibilities or the deeper issues in conversations or relationships. If there's an uncomfortable topic on the horizon, we might feel tempted to just gloss over it and keep things light with a joke, just to avoid that tension. Because emotional intelligence does come naturally, we're expressive and in tune with others' feelings. But when things get serious, Honestly, sitting with heavy emotions can be a bit of a struggle. Now, if this sounds like you, it's really important to work through building emotional resilience and learning to be comfortable with discomfort because this helps us build deeper relationships and handle those tricky moments without needing to brush them off because they're not fun. So let's say you're in a parenting moment in the kitchen and someone's been rude about the food you made. As a sanguine, you might respond with humour or a touch of exasperation and maybe deflect it with a joke, just to keep things positive. Now when it comes to repair, you bring your warmth and humour into the mix. You imagine yourself maybe saying, hey, sorry I yelled kiddo, don't worry about it, with a playful smile, and let it go. But here's the thing, your child might feel like you're not taking their feelings seriously, even if it's not your intention. So things can get tricky. If we minimise the situation with humour, and try and move on quickly because that's what we like the best, we might unintentionally miss the chance to let our child express any lingering hurt that they may have. We might skip reflecting on our behaviour, focusing on restoring the good vibes rather than truly addressing what's happened. So for a sanguine repair is all about reconnecting and bringing that warmth back into the relationship. If this is you, and I need to do this too, instead of brushing it off, Try approaching your child with genuine empathy and humour, maybe with something like, hey, I lost my cool there, didn't I? It wasn't fair for you. Opening up a conversation. A light-hearted apology and a warm hug can make repair feel emotionally real. And taking this extra step adds depth to that repair, something that the sanguine often needs, and it gives your child that space to be heard. With a bit more patience, and room for those tougher emotions that will help you build even stronger, more resilient relationships with those that you love. All right, now let's talk about the choleric, the dominant temperament. If this is you, you are someone who knows what you want and you go after it. This is my husband, through and through, assertive, independent, with a natural energy that pushes things forward. While others hesitate, you're the one that steps in and makes decision and takes charge. Efficiency and effectiveness are like your personal superpowers. If you're a choleric, one of your standout strengths is your ability to cut through indecision and bring clarity. And being a quick, strategic and focused thinker, you're a natural leader. Now, does this sound like you, as you're listening? Can you relate to these choleric traits? You might have some choleric in you, but not all of it, because remember we can have a mixture of temperaments. But if this feels familiar, keep on listening. And if you know someone in your life who sounds like this, definitely keep listening. Now I know that being right matters to you. And this is where you get a lot of your confidence and sense of control. Knowing your stuff and having a plan is where you find strength. And that's a great thing. But sometimes that drive to be right can make it a little harder to open up to other people's perspectives or admit that you've missed something. Now I'm not sure if you remember There was a show when I was younger called Happy Days, and there was a character called Fonzie. Now Fonzie couldn't say sorry to save his life. And this is the choleric. Sorry is not a word in their repertoire. They find it extremely tough to admit being wrong. However, a balanced choleric learns to value growth over ego. They understand that listening doesn't take away their authority, it actually enhances their results by bringing insights into what they might have missed on their own. And because you are results driven, it's easy to miss the emotional details along the way. And it's not that you don't care, it's just emotions can feel secondary when you've got a goal in sight. And here's where the emotional intelligence comes in. Being naturally confident in your decisions, if you add a little empathy and patience into the mix, You know, that could be a really big game changer for you. Not just in your personal life, but actually in your professional life as well. It's all about noticing how your assertiveness impacts others and learning to take an input without feeling like you're being undermined. 
So as a choleric, think of it as a strategic tool. If you understand people better, you'll get more out of them, which leads to better outcomes. Now let's get real. Say you're in the kitchen putting dinner together and your kid walks in complaining about the food. You know what your reaction might be? Mmm, probably be a little intense. You probably will yell, talk in a louder voice and possibly say some things that you really don't mean. Because you're thinking, really? I put in the effort and this is what I get? Now, your frustration's understandable because you value respect and acknowledgement and it really hits a nerve when that's missing. Because you're very extroverted in your energy and loud and often unemotional with the words you choose, this can mean that there's often a greater need of repair afterwards. But here's the good news. Your goal orientation and resilience means that you don't avoid the hard stuff, not like the sanguine. Once you've cooled off, you're likely to see the need to fix things and keep respect in the relationship. For you, it's about being direct and making things clear and showing you're committed to making things better. However, however, here's something a choleric should watch for. Because you're so focused on efficiency, your repair attempt can sometimes come off as a bit intense or like, let's just get this over and done with. It's like checking off a box, apologize and move on without taking time to show warmth or listen to their feelings. While you're good at owning up, you might skip that softer emotional connection, which will actually make the repair stick. In the end, your strength is direct and resilience. And so just by adding a touch of empathy, Slowing down a bit, letting your child see you're genuinely connected, you can make a huge difference. You don't have to change who you are. You can still be that decisive leader, but by making repair something that your child feels, you'll build an emotional bond that will be lasting and strong. It's about making sure that your relationships benefit just as much from your strengths as your results do. Now let's take a look at the third temperament, the phlegmatic, the steady If this is you, you're a naturally calm and patient person and you're drawn to keeping the peace. You bring a great sense of ease and stability into relationships because you generally prefer harmony over conflict. When you're around, people feel comfortable and connected and you often work really quietly in the background to make sure harmony is maintained. If you can relate to what I'm saying here, this means that when things get tense, this is especially stressful for you. When a tough situation comes up, your first instinct as a phlegmatic is to get in there, de-escalate and keep that intensity down. You don't want to jump into confrontations or react loudly. Instead, if you're phlegmatic and you know someone who is, that irritation is usually held back. Maybe there's a little sigh, but the frustration mostly stays inside to avoid any conflict. In a situation where your child is testing your patience, you're likely to respond in a calm, even-tempered way steering clear of confrontation. Now this calm approach is a gift, but it can make repair a little tricky. Let's say you're in the kitchen, your child says something rude about the dinner you've made because you don't want to stir things up. You might downplay your own feelings and just say to yourself, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just forget about it. Or if you have yelled slightly in frustration, you might brush it off afterwards, even if your child feels hurt or confused. While you're trying to keep the peace, This approach can often skip over real issues that might need addressing. When it's time to repair, you might feel tempted to move quickly over things, brushing away the moment, rather than going more deeply into what happened. Your emotional intelligence is strong. You're empathetic, and you want to genuinely understand and make people feel good. Unlike a choleric or even a sanguine, where there's often a bit bigger of an emotional display, your avoidance of conflict can mean that you miss out on full resolution, leaving some unresolved tension hanging there beneath the surface. So don't hold back. Don't keep all your frustrations and feelings inside. Share them with the person, your child, your partner or a friend, especially when you feel annoyed or hurt. Otherwise, for a phlegmatic, it tends to build up like a volcano and then one day, all of your emotions might explode. And when this happens, let me tell you, The damage is often far greater than if you'd addressed the tensions along the way. And while your calm presence is a huge strength, 
paying attention to these moments when a deeper conversation is needed can help you build even stronger, more open relationships with your loved ones. In the moments that you do engage in repair, you are capable of creating a peaceful and gentle atmosphere. You are more likely to approach your child in a calm and steady way, saying something like, I'm sorry I responded that way, I was feeling overwhelmed. You keep things non-dramatic and you focus on re-establishing harmony and making sure that your child feels reassured by your calm, comforting presence. For you, a good repair is where everyone walks away feeling understood and a little closer. Does this description fit you or anyone that you know? Last but definitely not least, we have the melancholic, the conscientious temperament. Now let's talk about what it really means to be melancholic. I know so many beautiful melancholics and when it comes to navigating those challenging emotional moments with people that you care about, you shine. You are thoughtful, sensitive and deeply introspective. You pick up on emotional details that others might miss. You put a lot of heart into everything you do. Does this resonate with you or someone in your life? If so, keep listening. When something doesn't go quite right, say your child makes a critical comment in the kitchen, your first reaction might be to feel it yourself on a deep level. Instead of showing open anger, you might internalise their words, seeing them as a critique of your efforts. Rather than expressing frustration outwardly, you're often more likely to feel hurt and disappointed. And instead of reacting loudly, you might respond with silent treatment or a pained expression. Now this thoughtfulness is a real strength, but it can make repair a bit tricky. Because you are so sensitive and self-reflective, you might dwell on what went wrong, overthinking every detail and focusing on your own feelings of regret. You might find yourself saying things like, oh, I'm sorry, I feel like the worst parent ever, and get wrapped up in guilt. Now this empathy is something that makes you so caring, but sometimes it can shift the repair away from your child's feelings and turn it into something more about your own regret, which can be overwhelming and confusing for your child. For example, if you've set a high bar for yourself with something as simple as preparing a meal, or you're hoping to create the perfect experience for your family and something goes wrong, or you feel it falls short, you might be really quick to blame yourself or dwell on how it could have been better. This tendency to aim for perfectionism can be inspiring, but when it's coupled with self-criticism, it can make repair harder than it really needs to be. When it's time to repair, your strength in empathy and thoughtfulness really shine. You're likely to approach care by sitting with your child and talking the situation through in a heartfelt way. You might say something like, I was hurt when I heard that comment and I didn't respond well. You take the time to help them understand the impact of their words while also encouraging a meaningful conversation that helps them understand their emotions too. For you, a good repair isn't just about patching things up, it's about fostering emotional development and mutual respect. Your goal is to make sure that you and your child feel genuinely understood and closer. But remember, the most effective repair doesn't have to be perfect or overthought. Sometimes simplicity is just as powerful as depth. And one more thing for the melancholic, avoid sharing your insecurities and your guilt about whether you think you're a bad parent with your child, young or old. Sometimes it can be repeated back to you later. And honestly, it will leave you feeling far worse about yourself. To teach resilience, it's important to model resilient behaviour. Instead of self-criticism, you might say, you know what, we all make mistakes and I'm really sorry for mine. Let's move forward together. Repairing our relationships with our children even when we've messed up or feel reluctant to do it sends a powerful message that our relationship with them is more important than any mistake that we might make. Each temperament brings a unique strength to the repair process And embracing that strength, rather than striving for perfection, can deepen the bond that you share. Remember too, that you might be talking to a child whose temperament is really different from your own. You might need to consider how their temperament prefers to repair an argument. But that's a topic for another episode. Please take a listen to my earlier podcast for more important knowledge about the four temperaments. So next time, if you're wondering... 
is it really worth that effort to try again? Please remember that your willingness to put in the effort in a way that feels right for you and your child is a lasting gift that you give yourself and them, no matter what their age. Thank you for listening to Parenting and Personalities. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you could leave a rating and a review. That would help others learn about this podcast. If you're interested in discovering more about personality types, you'll find my book, Who Is This Monster or Treasure My House, on Booktopia or Amazon. If you have an episode idea, please send a note to thepersonalitycoach at gmail.com. Many thanks to our producers at Stories and Strategies, and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 